Good afternoon or even good morning depending on where you are and welcome to AXA Coral Live. We are here at the Kamabi Research Station on the island of Curaçao in the Caribbean and I'm very pleased to welcome uh, again uh, Dr. Mark from my um, to Coral Live. Um, Mark is the uh, science director here at Kamapu, so thank you very much uh, for being here with us. Um, just to welcome schools uh, that we have from the USA, Canada and Brazil. Um, and a couple of shout outs for you guys. We have Mrs. Black and Mrs. Shaw's second graders in Walton KS, and I think that's Kansas, I think. I think so, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Big welcome to you coming in. Um, in fact, our interviewee, um, uh, Kristen Marhaver, is, is, from, is, is from Kansas, so fantastic. And um, also we have um, hello from Jack. Jack's at Intermediate School in Connecticut um, in the States. Um, hello from Big Fork, Montana with Mrs. Emsley's fifth grade class. Excited to be here. We're excited to have you. And we've said hello to Walton um, in Kansas. Fantastic to have you with us. Um, so the format for today is we're going to have a little chat and I'd love to know how you ended up um, being here on, on Curacao, which is what seems like an amazing uh, job and then we'll take some of the questions uh, coming through Good idea. online. Um, so Mark, Kamabi, um, a research station, what, what does that mean? What's involved? Um, well, Kamabi, the building that you might be able to see right after. I mean, in fact, we're in the wet lab. Or, or we're in the, in the back lab and it's actually funny because this room used to be the, uh, uh, a swimming pool where people used to grow turtles and then that didn't happen anymore and then they, we made it into the net lab, but it's very old. And that's nice because Kamabi is old too. It's uh, the second oldest marine station in the Caribbean. And it's six years old, and it pretty much started when people uh, invented dive gear. Uh, the underwater world, it's not something you can easily get access to. So only when people in, uh, invented uh, dive gear could we jump in the water and go see what the underwater world, including quarries, what they look like. Um, so around that time, and that's the 1950s, uh, is when people got so enthusiastic about the coral reefs of Curaçao yeah. that they needed a place to work, and that's where Kamabi came from. Okay. So that's how it started six years ago, and then it sort of grew, and right now we do other things as well, like uh, in addition to the research thing, we do uh, management of n uh, nature parks on Curaçao, and we have an education department for their school kids on Curaçao. Uh, amazing. So, so it's a little bit of everything. A little bit of everything yeah. from 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 the early early beginnings is is just a base for people who wanted to explore the underwater world to having that sort of like conservation and outreach and education exactly. mandate as well. And and how did you get involved in in sort of you know in in Kamabi? Kamabi. Well, um, when I was a student in the Netherlands, I uh, always knew that I wanted to do coral reef biology. So like many people in the Netherlands, they end up at Kamabi uh, because that's the place where you go study coral reefs. Um, and then I stayed here for a few years, did a PhD afterwards, also here, okay. went some other, other places. And, and at some point people here asked like, hey, uh, we want to make our coral reef program bigger. Would you like to come uh, back to Curaçao and then go work for Kamabi? And that's how I ended up here 10 years ago. 10 years ago, wow. And, and uh, what changes have you seen o over those 10 years? It is, it is, like, I guess everybody's heard stories like this. Coral are not doing that well. Uh, Curacao is not an exception to that. But the nice thing about Curacao is that, like, we have reefs that tell different stories. So there's okay. the, uh, and that, that is what makes them uh, uh, interesting study. There is the reefs that do what we all think happens to coral reefs. Corals die, algae take their place, and then you no longer have a coral reef. Um, at, the, uh, at the other end, uh, if you go to the east side of the island, okay. there's like a large, large, large stretch of uh, coral reef. There's no development on land. Uh, there's not that much fishing. So it's pretty much what Caribbean reefs looked like 100 years ago, uh, but wow. you still can find on Curacao. So that's the nice thing about Curacao is that there's a sort of a time machine. If you go dive on those reefs, you can get a good idea of what Caribbean reefs um, look like 100 years ago. And then there's a few places along the coast and those are the interesting ones like if you b sort of think about what everybody says it gets too warm uh, if all the fish go away the corals uh, yeah. uh, go away pollution coral die and that we have places that are heavily polluted where there's no fish and we still see a lot of corals so these corals are telling something like hey uh, yes it's not going that well but it's not that we're dead yet we yeah. can still tell stories that might be useful to sort of think about what coral reefs are going to look like in the future 
Wow, so uh, it makes it amazing to hear that there's still these sort of, you know, I want maybe not pristine, but some certainly sort of healthy coral reefs yes. on, on, on the east, eastern tip of the island. It's funny, when, when you take pictures there, people, when they see them, they say like, whoa, I did not know that you could take color pictures 100 years ago, and then you tell them like <laughs> that picture was taken yesterday. <laughs> oh, well, that, I mean, it's, that's very heartening, because I, I know that a lot of our audience watching, they get a lot of their knowledge about um, coral reefs from, from the media, and obviously there's a, there's a worrying story that's, that's, that's out there. And, and, and that's true, but, but the way that people sort of think about coral reefs a lot is that like, okay, there's a little bit of pollution, a little bit of warmer water, and then everything dies. And, and this is actually not what, what is the case. Like a coral reef is not, and, and that's by calling it a coral reef. Uh, I mean, you don't call a forest a tree forest or something, and then there's trees and they all do the same. But that's how we think about corals often, is that like all corals do the same, and they all die the same way, and it's all going to be misery from now on. Um, what we see actually is if you look at pieces of reef through time, sure, there's a lot of corals that are having uh, coral species that need certain conditions and when they're not there anymore, they die. Yeah. But there's a lot of other species that can still grow even today. So this whole idea that coral reefs are this sort of glass box or glass store where if you touch it, it only breaks and then it will never repair is actually not true at all. Yes, there's more dying maybe than growing but it's not that there is no corals growing on even today's reefs wow and so f from from growing up um in the netherlands to to ending up on curacao ob obviously i mean the the coral reefs of, of the netherlands aren't, aren't, aren't that famous <laughs> so yeah so non-existent famous. actually non except for a few aquaria maybe yeah <laughs> so so how, how how did uh um how, how did that happen how did you how did the sort of coral reef bug get you um well, first, I was actually uh, going to start marine biology in the Netherlands. I was thinking about that because I like diving uh, a lot. I'm like, well, here, as long as I can dive, I'll do it. So if I have to go study m worms in a mud somewhere, that's what it is then. Um, but then a friend of mine or somebody that I knew at the university needed help on Bonaire, which is an island uh, right next to Curaçao. Okay. And he's like, you want to come over and then uh, help me with my project? And this was on parrotfish, actually. And then I came jumped in the water, saw a coral reef for the first time, uh, and then that was it. I was sold and never wanted to do anything else after that. So, so what is it? I mean, because you, you, I mean, I've, I've met a lot of people who, who ended up being coral scientists and say, I jumped in the water for the first time, I dived on a, on a coral reef for the first time, and that was it. That, that just was, I knew from that moment on, I wanted to, this is, this is my life. It's, it's how it goes. I mean, it happens with uh, other things as well. It's like, uh, if you like a painting, you just like what it. Is, or what is, what, 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 I mean, describe that first, what is that first experience? How, how is that so transformative? Um, I guess because you're sort of entering a world where, I mean, people are seeing the Finding Nemo movies, for instance. It's like that, but on steroids. It's, it's way better than in the, and the Nemo movie is great, but it's actually nicer when you actually get to fly through it, because that's the nice thing about diving. It's not that you're sort of walking around looking at things, but you're actually flying through the world like a bird in a forest. And you get to see things that are high underneath you, around you. So it's, it's way more that you feel part of something that is all around you than, than when you're on land. And then the, 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 the huge diversity of things that you see. There's big things, small things, uh, colorful things, boring things, everybody doing something different. Um, so it, it is, it, it, it's like a hundred, reading a hundred books at the I mean, same it's time. It's the amazing, that amazing sort of sense of abundance as well that you, that yep. when you're in the sea, that. I th for me, sort of personally, that on land it is very rare to be surrounded by that many species of that of that much diversity that close. It, it is, and then that that's the thing because, like, yeah, you can walk to a forest, and everybody knows that there is deer in a forest. But then, if you walk into a forest, you don't always see a deer. Like on a coral reef, which is different than a forest. Like a lot of people call coral reefs the rainforest of the ocean. Yeah, this is not true because corals are actually animals, like Kristen talked about as well. And I guess because of coral reef, oh, there's a school of dolphins flying by right now. That's actually funny. A, bo a pot of bottlenose dolphins is uh, swimming by here right now. I can't go. No, they just went around the corner. Just went around the corner. Um, but, but, but because there's a lot of animals. <laughs> and go outside if they come back. Don't worry, guys. <laughs> yeah, we will call them. And, um, um, so because I guess they're animals and because they're used to big things. I mean, yep. when you're on a reef, there's big turtles, there's big fish around. I guess they're less afraid, like... Um, 
uh, animals in a forest. We look clumsy on the water, so I guess we're not that that intimidating either. So you get you can get way closer to animals yeah. than when you could in the forest, and that makes it easier, and fun, more fun. It's amazing. So um, thank you very much. Just before we, we look at some of the questions, uh -huh. um, we're, we're really talking today um, about the sort of coral ecosystem. Uh, so it's not just the coral animal itself, but it's how that coral animal and maybe sponges and, and a couple of other sort of, of, of the sort of mm -hmm. the habitat building organisms, how that all works. And I was wondering whether you could just take us through some of the basics, maybe using this yeah, um, so aquarium. this is actually um, like we have a few of the ingredients here to tell that uh, story. There's a little water, it's so hot here. Um, brr, pa, 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 pa. Clean the windows a little bit. <laughs> but the, the thing that you can see in here, you see that big hairy thing sitting in the background? That is an anemone, and everybody uh, has seen anemone. So an anemone, you cannot see the body. Unless you're in Kansas, maybe. Uh, yeah. And then, <laughs> so the body is basically a sack, and then the mouth and the anus of that beast is pretty the same hole. Um, and around that sack, there's all these wires sticking up, and those are uh, its tentacles. And the tentacles, you can see these little stripes in there. And in those stripes, what those little stripes are, are little cells that have a little spring-loaded barb. And then when food floats by in water and it touches those uh, tentacles, the spring load will go and the barb will plunge into a copper pot or whatever. <laughs> <coughs> and then catch it and then when it does like it's actually doing that right now it's like taking one of those tentacles and it sort of goes in its mouth it caught something there goes another one and that's how they eat and that's how you can see how it actually is an animal because it's actually catching things from the environment and then eating them but that anemone that's very big over here is pretty much the basic idea of a coral so corals are not that big the polyps are not that big because a polyp is nothing than a small anemone and then what, what uh, corals do, and then, for instance, if you would uh, look at this little coral that's uh, in front of here, you see all these little circles, and all these little circles are the polyp. So it's a miniature version of that one. The other difference between a coral and an anemone is that corals work together, and Kristen talked about that as well, is that they basically make copies of themselves. So basically what you get is this little uh, carpet of little polyps that are still attached together, a carpet of mini anemones, if you will, that are together. This guy, corals, um, you don't see the tentacles sticking out because most species will actually do that only at night. This one, this species here, does eat during the day and you can see it has its tentacles out during the day. Um, because they make copies of themselves, they need a place to sort of live on because otherwise if they uh, would just make copies of themselves, they would sort of start to look like a little pancake. And on coral reefs, because there are so many species there, it's very busy. So if you would make, be a pancake and sort of go uh, sideways, what will happen is you're going to run into other things. So the easiest way to do is, in, if you cannot go sideways, is to go up. Okay. And to do that, corals make a skeleton, and then there's, the, there's one line right here. So here again, you can see all these little holes. So this is a dead coral. Um, but if you would take off that layer of polyps, the little mat of interconnected polyps of anemones, take that off, you can see their little homes, so each of these little crater is, is the home of one polyp and they're all connected but you see that together they make a skeleton like we make skeletons yeah. as well and because the skeleton sort of grows up they actually have room to grow and divide and divide and divide and keep doing that and some of them do it like a little mound other ones like the one that you have over here they do it more like a branching shape and then each species sort of does its own thing so you, you can already see from the the skeletons that they make, what sort of species you're dealing with. So you okay. can see that they're completely different and this one is different again. And that sort of lets to this idea that like corals, because a lot of people, if you would go here on the beach and ask like, hey, do you know what a coral is? Is it an animal? Is it a plant? Or is it a rock? Well, it's an animal because you can see that it's doing yeah. stuff, it's catching stuff. It's sort of a rock in a way because we have a skeleton, but if skeleton defines a rock, we would be rocks too because we have a skeleton too. And then there is the, uh, the other thing that, like, corals have little algae inside their tissue okay. because there's not a whole lot of food. So if you're not a species with big tentacles like this one over here, uh, most corals rely on sunlight. But they, as an animal like us, we, they cannot live from sunlight, so they need help. Mm -hmm. And they get help from tiny, tiny little algae. They're very, very small. You need a thousand to put uh, in a uh, or a hundred to put in a millimeter. Uh, so they're very tiny. You cannot see them, but they're in the tissue 
like really inside of the tissue. And what they do is they take the sunlight like any pl uh, plant does and then uh, makes it into sugar like plants okay. do and then gives it to the uh, coral in exchange for a home. And then because they do that, they need light. That's also why in uh, uh, many corals you see that they almost grow like a solar panel. And it is because they actually like a lot of plants, try to catch as much light possible course, for their little yeah. friends, the algae that live in their tissue. So coral, they're the building blocks because they actually build blocks like this one here. And they have sort of characteristics of rocks, animals because they catch and then the algae because they need light. Wow, and so that, that provides almost like a three-dimensional home for, for, for other, yeah. other types of life. Yeah, because then the corals are the, uh, the biggest builder on the water. Okay. It's not that, that corals are the only ones that build blocks, uh, because there's uh, certain algae, for instance, that can also um, make um, rock. But people see it more as like, hey, you have to almost see this as a house where the corals build the blocks and then the algae cement it together. Okay. Um, but then if you sort of go, so okay, there's a coral, builds a block, uh, it happens in multiple places, corals die naturally, other corals grow on top of it. You pretty much get what a house is, or a city even, where these building blocks together uh, result into a house or a city, and because that structure is there, other animals start showing up. Amazing. And then the other thing we've got in here, we've, we've got some s sponges. Yeah. And, and sponges, like most, most of our um, audience might think of that, that's something you have in the kitchen or the bathroom. Um, yeah, I guess there is one here. Uh, this one, <laughs> it's actually pink too. But that's sort of what they really look like in, um, in, in nature. Also pink, but completely different. And so natural sponge is what, what, what we first saw. And I think that um, we can, we can see, see them here. So, so what, do, what do the sponges um, get up to and how do they help? Well, the reef? sponges that you see here are the sponges that live in holes and crannies on the reef. Because that's actually uh, the nice thing about a reef. If you would look at it uh, from above, it's almost like looking at a city. Okay. But if you would look at a city from the sky, the only thing you would see is roofs. Okay. And that's sort of what, what, what happens on a coral reef too. So if you look at a coral reef, the only thing that you see the roof, which are the corals, when they're building the structure that's underneath it. But then if you would go dive in there and then go look underneath the roofs, yep. you find that there is rooms and caves and, and nooks and crannies everywhere. And that's where things like these sponges live. So these are not the ones... Um, that are big and the, the vase-like structures that you also see in the Finding Nemo movie, for instance, they're encrusting and they live in these big holes on the reef. But the cool thing is, is that like, if you start to look at like, hey, on a coral reef, yep. what do we have the most of? It's often like the uh, sponges like this, and not uh -huh. because you can see them, but because they're all hiding in the cryptic surfaces underneath, in the holes in the cranny. So there's so much of that. Amazing, and so we've got this this 3D sort of underwater world being created, these, these corals, these sponges. Life everywhere. Out, life everywhere. And then that allows for more and more the sort of like the bigger animals that maybe we associate with, um, you know, whether it's the clamfish if you're over the other side of the world or the yeah. sharks and the parrotfish. The and fish, the, the lobsters, the octopuses, you, you name it, a thousand Amazing. species. So, um, just to come to some of our questions, this is from, from Kansas. Um, we would like to know, what is your favorite part of the reef? To be honest, the, the, deep, the deepest part, and Pim Bongarts is going to yeah. talk about that later. Uh, and that is because if you go deeper... Uh, what do you mean? This there's like a, got, do, do, 80, 100 meters. Yeah, so we've got corals because down to 3,000 the, the, meters. The, 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 the reef down there, and yeah. the might also because it's deep and it's sort of futzing with your brain a little bit, but the reef down there starts to look like a fairy tale world. It's really quiet. There's a lot of sand, but then in the sand there's these big rocks, and on it are corals that look different than the ones that you see in shallow water, right. like these ones. They're more branching. It, it's very serene. Uh, there's weirder organisms living there. It, it's not like the deep sea where you see fish with lights on their head and all that. It's not that crazy yet. So there's a twilight zone. It, yeah, that, that's a better. And then when you swim there by yourself, and then like, that, that, that's beautiful. Wow. Um, and then we've got a, a few, f few questions here. So what are the, we'll, we'll come to the sort of like the, the problems and, and, and uh, later on. But why, why are coral reefs important? Um, th that is for, for various reasons, like right here, for instance, um, on Curaçao. It's a small island, 
people come to Curacao to see corvids. They like to dive, they like to snorkel, or they like to just go in the water every now and then. And a lot of these people uh, have said, like, well, if those reefs wouldn't be there, there's nothing to see. Nobody goes to Africa and to a wild park if there's no rhinos or uh, dress. It's the same. So when these corals are not there, people would not come. So because they don't come, you don't get enough money or you don't get as much money from tourism. So for islands like this, where tourism is an important thing, yeah. the reason why people actually go there is, amongst other things, coral reefs. So if the coral reefs go, then... So that's one. And the other thing is, is that like coral reefs building the blocks that they make. Like every now and then we get a big storm here. And yeah. then usually we think as people like, well, uh, we're going to protect this building. Let's go build a dam somewhere. So if the waves come, it's not going to damage what we build yeah. on shore. So this is actually why coral reefs are important to people that are not even in the water. It's even important to people that are on shore. Wow. Because basically a coral reef is nothing more than like a big stone wall on the water. So if that wave or storm comes, the corals are capable of taking a lot of energy out of those waves yeah. so they don't destroy things that are on land. And the other thing is, but that's more in the sponge world, yep. is that all these organisms that live on um, uh, uh, coral reefs are becoming the new source where people find new medicines, for instance. Wow. So uh, there's a lot of diseases that we cannot treat. Um, in the past, people would, would go to the rainforest because yes. there people sort of knew, like, oh, take that plant for this. The problem is, is that we're not plants, we're animals as well. So to yep. look for medicines that work for us, uh, animals like sponges are the uh, way to go and and a lot of me new medicines are actually found on coral reefs so it's the undiscovered medicine cabinet of uh, wow. the future you could argue and that's just three examples of why reefs can be important and i think this is some some amazing uh, n number like sort of reefs are sort of if you put a price on it worth about three hundred fifty thousand dollars per hectare per year more than that more than that. It depends where you are, but, but, but it is a lot of money. It is a lot of money. Yeah. And, and it's mainly for those, for those reasons that, that, um, that protection from storm protection, that tourism. And that's the thing, because, it, like, okay, it's nice to protect them because you like to swim on coral reefs. It's because you like to look at corals. Well, that's fine. But, you know, if you have, based on the examples I was just yeah. uh, saying, like, okay, if you're working in the tourism industry, you need reefs because otherwise the people that pay your income yes. won't show up. If you have a house on shore, you don't even go in the water. It's nice to have coral reefs because uh, they protect you against waves so you don't have to build these dams yourself. And we're all going to get sick at some point. And then if the medicines uh, that, that could cure whatever we're going to have yeah. later come from here, it's probably good to have that medicine cabinet around as well. So those are all reasons to... Wow. So it doesn't matter where you're coming from. It's always good to uh, preserve coral reefs because they do so much for us. Um, this is um, a question from Caden. Uh, thank you, Caden. Um, how does coral get its fluorescence? Ah, that's actually an interesting question. Um, so, yeah, we cannot see it right now because uh, fluorescence is only something that you can see uh, during the night. But if you then would take a blue light, some of these colonies in here would light up green. And it's a little bit of a mystery why that is. And, and there's two ideas uh, there. One is that uh, fluorescence sort of increases with corals that leave deeper. So then as light becomes less and less and less, yeah. fluorescence helps to have more light for the algae in there. The other reason is that um, corals can make a, a fluorescent skin to help them protect against UV. So it's either okay. helping the little algae inside their tissue or sunscreen, basically. And which one it is, or maybe it's probably both, uh, we don't know. So it's brilliant, thank you very much. Um, and this is from um, Brigham. What is the most colorful species of coral you have seen? Because obviously we, we, we talk about um, the, this algae being inside uh -huh. the coral, so that's the sort of reds and browns and greens and yeah. yellows. Do you get really colorful coral? What, what's there, the most there is one color, we don't have it here. It's, uh, it's actually one that grows like a pancake. And it occurs in 36 color varieties. And it's not like shades of green. It's a pink, pink with blue, pink with red, uh, black, yellow dots, all wow. sorts of uh, combinations. So th that is, the, as far as I know, the one that is the most colorful. And is that a species you get here? In, in yeah, yeah. if you would jump off the pier, it's actually against the piling here as well. It's a brown one here. But if you would go on the reef, you can find all these okay. different color versions uh, combined. Amazing. Uh, so Taylor is asking, there's been a, uh, a lot of uh, interest in the media about plastic and its impact on the marine environment. Does plastic have an impact on, on the coral ecosystem? 
Um, I'm sure it does. Um, we have never looked at it here, but from what you read everywhere else, it just ends up everywhere. And then again, like if you um, see what anemones and corals do, catching everything out of the water. So I um, would have a hard time believing that if plastic sort of came by, it wouldn't end up in those things at some point. So, yeah. And do, do, you, do you see examples of, of, sort of bigger bits of plastic smothering the reef at all out here? That's, it, it, it stays afloat mostly okay. here. So what happens is that it washes ashore uh, and then it comes out of boats and there's a lot of it that comes with the rivers from South America because that's a thing that happens a lot that people think that, look at all this trash. Um, it's all coming from Curacao. They're dirty over there. But that's actually not the case that much uh, because a lot of trash goes in the ocean and the ocean connects all these islands and then eventually it ends up, especially yeah, on shores, but a lot of it, unfortunately, yeah. Amazing. We're going to take some questions that have come on from, from the live chat. Uh -huh. um, what science classes did you need to take to become a scientist? Um, well, biology. And, and, and I actually think because a lot, there's uh, a lot of places where you can become like sort of specialized in tropical ecology. Um, I like the um, general biology much better because then uh, the same reason, like if you would walk into a forest and, and sizes between trees differ or the patterns in nature, they're the same everywhere. Um, so to study things from that sort of basic principle, using coral reefs as an example where you can study these yeah. things is, I think, the way to go. So I, I would stick to basic biology, know what everybody already did, because that's the thing too. People, a lot of people study... Um, go study biology of marine biology, coral reef biology, uh, thinking that they're going to come up with something that nobody's ever done before. Quite often, uh, it has. So it's, it's really uh, good to um, sort of know what's already there, know your basic uh, principles, and that, that for corals, because they act a lot like plants. It's, for instance, like knowing what plants do, yeah. because people have studied plants way longer than corals because of the diving problem. Uh, and there's a lot to learn from it. And then when you know that, you go look on the water and see what's new, what doesn't fit the stories, and then you, that's what you go study. I mean, you, I think it was Isaac Newton who said, you know, we standing on the shoulders of giants um, in terms of the fact that his, his work was only possible because of the work that pre preceded him. We're wrong now. People will do this better. But then, like, I think it's like... Uh, so know what these shoulders are. And go stand on them, and then know that, like, people in the future will do it all better uh, and uh, that we probably might things get wrong but you know in the end we're all together we'll get there brilliant um this is from um walton school in in kansas what does an average day look like for you is there an average day well <laughs> no there, there, there there's not really an average day like right now it's sort of nice because the corals are making babies and it only happens uh once a year so now it's sort of simple there's only one thing that we're doing we're looking at uh, coral babies but since we're also doing parks management, it can range from, oh, there's a tourist in the park that got stuck in a cactus and we have to go get him out uh, to helping the government to, uh, oh, um, there's wheels. It, it can be anything. Amazing. Uh, so, and, and if, what would be a perfect work day if I'm going to go from average to perfect? From average to perfect? Well, yesterday was pretty perfect. It's the day where, like, we started looking for certain species that, Surprisingly, we did not know um, when they make babies. So there's like a hundred coral species. For a lot of them, we know when they make babies, which you would think is a very basic thing that like, oh, pff, by now with that many people diving, we should know these things, but we don't. That's how little we know about reefs pretty much. And then yesterday we uh, saw it happen for the first time. Then we collected the eggs because this particular species has males and females. Okay. Other coral species can do both at the same time. Uh, collected the sperms and the eggs from these, uh, put them together, and now we have, for the first time ever, like little babies first swimming around of, 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 that, of that species. Amazing. And then when that happens, it's like, well, now I'm looking at something that nobody's ever seen before. You're like, that's a pretty uh, that, good that, day. That, that, that's, that's, that's not bad. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and <coughs> this is also um, from um, Jack Jack's Intermediate School. Is how many times have you dived on the reef, and how long can you dive at one time? Uh, let's see, I think I made 5,000 dives in total, and uh, how long you can go sort of depends a little bit on how deep you go. Yeah. So the deeper you go, the with one dive tank you cannot stay that long, but I lived in an underwater house once for a week, 
So that's the longest time I've was been on the water. Was that in Florida? Yeah, that was the one in Florida. So that's um, uh, Aquarius. Aquarius Reef Base. Yeah. And, um, that was a lot of fun. So tell us a little bit about because I mean you and I know what that looks like, but for the for the students back at home, what what's, what's that like? So so the, the, the thing is, is um, if you go diving, at some point you have to go back up because your air is out. Um, a way to sort of deal with it is actually build on the water house where there's always air and then you basically you have to think about it, it's like an upside down bucket with an air bubble in it uh, and it looks like a space station and then what you do is you swim around in the water and then at the end of the day so you go back fill up your dive things go work fill up your dive things and at the end of the day you go in the bubble and there's a kitchen and there's your beds and then you can stay there and then you can sort of keep working all the time you can do eight ten hours on the water a day so you can get a lot of that stuff done. You don't have to worry about what happens above the water. It's amazing. Wow. Um, and again, from Jack, Jack to Intermediate, how large is the biggest coral reef and how tall is the biggest single coral colony? So the, 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 the tallest coral reef is the Great Barrier Reef. I think that's 3,000 miles long or something. I it it, the, it the, is the, insanely... 2,000 kilometers. Yeah, or, yeah. or three, yeah. Uh, it is insanely... Uh, big. The second largest one is close to here. Uh, it's in Mexico. And then there is corals that are living in the Pacific as well that are, I think, almost like 15 meters high. Wow. And they're like 40,000 years old or a little longer. Wow. And that's the oldest ones that people know of. Amazing. Um, interesting question now. This is, have you ever had a dangerous encounter with an animal around the reef? Uh, yes, uh, <laughs> and that was in the middle of the Pacific and we had to dive at the end of the day near a wreck and there were, uh, I was diving with somebody else and you couldn't see that much because there was okay. a lot of stuff in the water and then all these sharks start going up, uh, start showing up. We had a lot of equipment with us and the sharks started to eat it and then when we said like, okay, let's go now, this is not fun anymore. Uh, when we wanted to go to the surface, um, we had a rope with a flag yeah. to signal the boat where we was, but a manta ray had swim in the rope and then taken the buoy away and the person in the boat had followed the flag. So when we got to the surface, like ready, like, okay, there's so many sharks, we have to get out of the water, they're eating everything that we have. Uh, there was no boat anymore. So we were there in the middle of the Pacific uh, five days in a boat from anywhere, sharks everywhere trying to bite us, and then no taxi anymore. And then, thank God, a friend of mine came by in a little Zodiac, and he's like, what are you guys doing here? I'm like, well, come over, and we want to go in your boat right now, because this is not um, pleasant. And, and the sharks are coming, f the electrical signals from, from your equipment, is that one of the things that they're... They're just curious. I mean, yeah. over there, you swim in the water, and then... Um, uh, mm -hmm. So this is in the middle of the Pacific. It's islands where nobody's ever been before. So it's like pristine. It, it's the closest to pristine as you can get. Uh, and therefore, there's a lot of sharks swimming around. Uh, so every time you would look around, you see 40, 50 sharks all the time. But because that dive was... Uh, normally, we wouldn't dive when it gets the sun yeah. goes down. And this was the first time that we did it. And then basically, they're just curious. It's the time where they start hunting at night. And then we were just there at the right time, the time that they were getting active and frisky, I guess. Wow. I mean, sharks, sharks get a really bad reputation. Um, you know, they're, they're considered to be incredibly dangerous, yes. Um, but but we're, we're not that natural food. I no, mean, and, and quite often, like, it's funny because a lot of people say that, like, aren't you afraid of sharks? Because not so much here, but in the Pacific, you see them all the time. Yeah. Um, and then I say, like, whoa, not at all. I, I'm afraid of bears. I don't like bears at all. I think they're creepy and, and scary. <laughs> so every time that you speak to people from, I don't know, Norway, Canada, where you have uh, bears. Montana. Or, or Montana, probably. They're like, yeah. what? You're afraid of bears? We have them in our backyard. We go walk in the woods and we see them all the time. Then you know that bears are not that scary. But you have to sort of see them a lot to know that. And with sharks, it's the same thing. When you're underwater, they sort of swim around you. And they come closer. At some point, you might think like, okay, this is getting too close where you're swimming like this and they start swimming yeah. right here. And then you're like, okay, uh, we'll go out of the water. But it's never that you're swimming around and then all at once, uh, you get, it, it doesn't work like that. Like the, the same way that doesn't work like that with bears either. Um, so yeah, that's why I'm afraid of bears and that's why other people are afraid of sharks. You're afraid of what you don't know. You're afraid of what you don't know. Um, this one is a sort of like history of science and I'm not sure sort of whether, whether it is, this is known. Is when when was the first coral reef described by science? 
where and where and when. That is actually a good one. Um, pa, pa, pa. I would argue that that is the Hawaiians, um, because there is a lot of uh, old Hawaiian legends that um, say that the coral polyp is the most important organism on the planet uh, because they can build rocks. So you could argue, and that's, that's in large part here on Curacao as well. I mean, we should thank corals for the, the ground that is underneath yes, our yes, feet because yes. they pretty built that 30,000 yeah. years ago. And, and so in Hawaii, they speak about these corals with deep respect because of the fact that they built rocks and basically created land out of the ocean. Uh, and then the, the more scientific uh, descriptions, that, that would be the Darwin. He was the... The, the only or the first person, and uh, there have been a few before, but Darwin is, I guess, most famous for it, that started to describe coral reefs as biological structures with corals forming them. Again, this is like 150 years ago. They, they, they still couldn't jump in the water and see what it was. So they had to lower hooks on a rope in the water, drag up uh, what you could find, and then you would get things like this on an anchor. It's like the building blocks, but you would never get the idea yeah. of what a reef is. You have to go really wow. dive for that. But Darwin, I guess, then would be the first one to describe him. Um, this is, is coming coming from um, sort of shark fearing, bear bear loving Montana. Uh -huh. we'll to, 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 um, it's more complex. The bear know, country. The bear country. Uh, but um, how many uh, species of corals uh, live on a typical bit of reef? Um, I would actually argue that most people don't know that. Like you could say, because right now. And this is in large part because the, how did we define coral species 100 years ago is by dragging them out of the water and sort of by looking at the differences between all these sort of morphological things. So it's like, well, this is a mountain. This is more of a stick thing. And then because they all look different, these are three different species. Um, and that's why if you would ask somebody right now, how many species are there? Three. Yeah. These three. I mean, in the Caribbean, there's 100 based on this yeah. method. What we find, however, is that like things that look exactly like this, so yeah. you would have this one and one identically the same, uh, using genetics is that this one is actually as different from this one as a cat is different from a dog. Wow. And, and this is just starting, so that's what they call cryptic species, cryptic or species that are there, but you cannot see with the naked eye. You would have to go it's look at their... Meaning, meaning hidden, I think. Yeah. 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 Um, so you would have to go look at them with genetics or seeing that their behavior is different, is that this one spawns eggs in the fall and the other in the winter, something like that. And that is beginning right now. So despite the fact that if you re read a book, it would say like there's 100 species in the Caribbean, there's probably more based on this sort of hidden diversity that we're just recently starting to uh, appreciate. We've just got a, a, a few few minutes left, very sadly, but I was wondering whether you could give us a sort of whistle-stop tour of, of what a, like, a, a uh, working... What we have here? Um, well, the, the cool thing is, and this might be uh, uh, funny to start with then, uh, like I was saying, like yeah. only once a year, uh, corals like this make babies. Yep. Um, so that happened two days ago and yesterday. And then what happens is that each of these, uh, again, this guy, each of these polyps will produce a little bowl and that can have eggs uh, or it produces sperm or both yeah but if you mix them together you get a larvae it fertilizes each other you get a larvae and they start swimming around so we can start here with this little disc and this is sort of funny because like a lot of people uh, think that corals cannot move here I should probably take the lid off you see these tiny tiny dots in there uh, uh, can you see it like that and you, well there's water movement as well but uh, they're sort of swimming around too. So these are two-day-old coral larvae, and they just started swimming because they first have to develop a little bit. Now they have little hairs on their outside, so they start swimming around. They'll do that for uh, around five, six days, yeah. and then they start looking for uh, a place to settle on the bottom. So this is the life stage of corals, and again, here's where you can see that they're animals because they're actually moving around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so these guys will swim around for five days then they need to become something like this and the first step there is to sort of find a place where they can live forever and ever or for hundreds of years and what they do is they look for these things here so this is another organism that actually calcifies on these and these are they, these are actually algae they're crystals coralline algae and they make some sort of a cement but they also produce uh, substances that go in the water that would tell those larvae like look this is a good place to go it's calcified already. There's uh, probably beneficial microbes on them. There's no sponges here. There's no algae here. Come here. 
So those little uh, larvae, they can actually hear where coral yeah. reefs are. So if wow. you play in the south, they will go there. When they found the reef, they will go find these guys. And then they go, uh, they need a little nook or cranny to go settle in because again, they have to sit there for hundreds of years. And that's sort of what you see here. So you see all these different tiles. So here's one, for instance, they have that same Christos algae on them already. And then in combination with little rooms, if you will, huh. that are big and small. And then there's all different shapes in here. And we use these things to then sort of go see like, okay, coral larvae, you found your reef by smelling and listening where it is. Then you found the place on the reef based on these algae. Now, where do you want to wedge in so you're protected from grazing by fish, from little hermit crabs stepping on you? And then that's things like this that they prefer. Amazing. So here we're trying to sort of find out what it is that they prefer the most. So these are just lying around. There's no larvae on these. But then if you would throw those uh, baby corals with those guys, you pretty much get these. So what you see here is actually like all the different um, shapes that we're testing right now. And these guys, so it's a shape, it's a different uh, algae there on it, and there's actually baby corals on it. But you can see oh, how small okay. they are, so you yeah, cannot yeah, really yeah. See, uh, see them on these things right now. Um, then if they live on the water and they, they've settled, like life begins, and uh, they want to go bigger, and one of the reasons why they grow is because they eat. And what we're trying to uh, do here, there's these uh, tiles that are in here, again, with those tiny little uh, baby corals. They're attached to these gray things already. And there's different flow speeds in these things. Okay. And then what we see is that like each coral species has a preferred flow rate by which it's most efficient at catching food. So that's sort of what we started with, with that anemone. Mm -hmm. Like if there's raging currents, that anemone couldn't catch what was in the water. Um, under certain flow conditions, they can catch the most. And we're trying to sort of find that out here because if they can catch the most, they eat the most and they will grow the fastest. Got it. So they can grow to uh, certain sizes. Um, this is just a sponge experiment. Again, like uh, sponges are cri in the cryptic um, places on the reef. And what we're trying to do is like, it's almost like what you see here. Yeah, if you look at this shack here, the roof is one thing, but a lot of stuff is happening underneath. Um, and that's where these sponges are. We're trying to sort of find out what their role is within the wider ecosystem. And the reason why we don't really know that much about it is because people, when they look at the reef, often only look at the roof, at the corals, and not sort of what lives no, underneath it. And that's what it. that is. And then <clears throat> right here, um, that's also a reason why coral reefs often do not so great, is because water gets dirty. And one of the uh, reasons water gets dirty in, in, in addition to nutrients and chemicals and things like that is because there's like all sorts of gnarly microbes in the water. Got it. So what we do here is that the water comes in from the ocean, like all the gunk, all the debris, the particles get filtered out here. That's why that turns brown. Yeah. And then uh, it becomes, goes to a smaller and smaller and smaller filter. And at this one, the microbes are filtered out altogether. So the water comes out here, sterile. Yeah. And then what you see here, so these little mushroom little things, uh, is again one of those little habitats that we're providing to coral larvae. These guys were born a month ago, and again, they're so small that you cannot see them. But by giving them very clean water that has no gnarly microbes in them, uh, we uh, let them grow. And then when they uh, grow to a certain size, like if you would put them back on the reef when they're too yeah. small, they're not going to make it. So we let them grow in here to a certain size first, and then they go back on the reef. And these guys, they're a month old, and um, uh, they're in the three pull-up stage. So that one pull-up settled, yeah. it divided in two, and then one of those two divided in another one. And then they're like maybe a millimeter wide by now. Wow. So we're going to let those guys go for a little bit until they're even bigger. And, and then, oh, they go back to the, to the reef. Oop, back on the hill. So yeah, that's a little bit of what goes on here. And then th this, this blubbling thing on the, on the side is, again, like what you see in here is pretty much the same story as there with the sponges. Is that like all these um, little bins have little sponges. Uh, fortunately, this is not the most colorful ones. There's a little pump in there. And then we're trying to, again, see uh, what these uh, sponges do to begin with and how that sort of affects what happens to coral reefs seen as a city, so not only the roofs uh, as a whole. Amazing. Um, so very sadly, we, uh, we've only got sort of a, a minute or so left. Um, 
We've got a lot of um, questions, and I and I say them to the end to, to answer all at once. But concerned mm -hmm. young people uh, around the world who want to know what they can do um, to to to, ha to help. help help. What can they do to help? Well, what I would argue is that like a lot of people want to help by uh, saying that they're going to study coral reefs or something, and 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 say in what bad condition they are hoping that by sort of saying like look there's a problem there's a problem uh, other people will do the work to save him um, the problem has been described very well uh, we know that corvies are um, in problems if you don't know that by now no study is ever going to help to convince you uh, what has to happen now is um, the work to actually solve the problem and then for instance like what we just talked about there's microbes in the water well, how do they get in there? It's because, uh, say, water treatment facilities don't work. So what we need are people that uh, are going to think about how to make water treatment facilities. So this happens in nature, and we don't have to use these filters to do it. Um, how can we improve coral restoration, in if, if that's sort of something what you want to do? Well, th there's a lot of things that need to be uh, tried to see what works and what doesn't, so it can be uh, used. Uh, how can we advise other people what they should and should not do and then this is not people in the street no it's like people if uh they want to build a hotel and they're looking for like hey how do i do this because i know a lot of mm -hmm. hotels have killed the reefs in yeah. front of them like i want to do it right what do i do and then quite often like people looking for solutions like practical solutions they're often not there so um how can you help it's like don't focus on reiterating it's it's going bad it's going bad it's going bad yeah sure uh, we know that already uh and if you just want to study it for the sake of studying it please go ahead but but if you want to help i think a lot important thing is is that the people that will actually help with this uh, to yeah implement the solutions that that is where it has to go in the next 10 years because otherwise we might be too late it's actually getting there but faster is better possible so what i'm hearing is be a, a lawyer, be a politician, be a urban designer, urban planner, be a uh, run a tourism business, but think about yeah. how what you're doing fits it's, it's with the natural like world. Things, things have to change. Saying that things have to change is not going to change anything. You have to go actually do the work to make it change. So it's, it's not a single job. It's actually whatever you do, whether it's eating, whether yeah. it's working, whatever it is, just be mindful of how yeah. you can do that and then, better. Uh, if we all start doing that, it will become what we do. And then uh, at some point, one day, uh, and uh, this is actually not so far in the future, I, I believe, all these things will sort of click into place. And then especially with people that deal with technology, that have inventions to, yeah. you know, uh, have electricity problems solved. Uh, uh, it's getting there. I'm not that pessimistic, actually. Fan fantastic. Uh, but I think one thing just to say that whatever job you do being science literate even if you're not a scientist is pretty important uh, uh, yeah it's a healthy uh, form of skepticism i would argue uh, it's like learn but then also when um you you hear something that based on what you think or what you learn doesn't fit yeah what what you're seeing in front of you then start asking uh, questions in a polite way <laughs> and then hopefully, because, you know, if two people talk, one always learns. That's the definition of conversation. Yeah. So go there and let's all get smarter, I guess. Um, we just had one very um, last question com coming in from, from Montana. And they were really interested in the sort of the medicine bit that you were talking about. How, mm -hmm. is, is, that, is that a growing thing? That, that, that is a growing thing because um, lots of medicines in the past came from rainforest yeah. that rainforest is mostly plants and then if you're looking for medicines for people well we're not plants so what works for a plant might not work for us so what would work for us is something that would work for other animals as well and then here in come these sponges again because sponges they have to defend themselves against a lot of things because they cannot move so instead of running away which is what we do sponges defend themselves with substances and yeah. it is these substances that we've now found uh, are often suitable as medicines. And that, that this has only been happening for the past sort of 10, 15 years or so? Uh, yeah, something like that. Yeah, brilliant. So, lots of, well, thank you, Mark. Thank you so, so much for, for, for being part of Coral mm -hmm. Live again. It's